Another day at work for carabiners, and it looks pretty much like the previous day at work. Every carabiner is whole and shiny, the gates snap shut smartly, and in general, they're well organized, focused, and ready to perform their job of connecting the various parts of the blade chain. Carabiners are in the business of putting it all together. But every day a carabiner goes to work, its life is on the line. If things go wrong, the carabiner will break. And sometimes, even though the carabiner remains uninjured, it fails in its job of connecting the elements of the blade chain. This video is an introduction to carabiner satisfaction. It defines both the challenges that carabiners are asked to accomplish and the capabilities that carabiners bring to their work. Carabiners are content when their capabilities match or exceed those required by the challenge. Armed with this knowledge, your task is to identify ways to improve carabiner working conditions so that the risk of failure, dismemberment, or revocable deformation is acceptable. For carabiners, the big picture looks something like this. On one hand, the carabiner challenge distribution shows the difficulty of the jobs that carabiners are asked to perform. This carabiner challenge distribution is a way of looking at the prevalence and the magnitude of forces that a carabiner might be asked to sustain while at work. On the other hand, are the strengths that carabiners might possess as they meet these challenges. This strength distribution shows the prevalence and magnitude of the forces that a carabiner is capable of sustaining. The dissatisfaction is contained in the tiny red sliver of area that represents all the combinations of carabiner challenges and strengths in which the applied force is greater than the carabiner's strength. Confession. The shapes of these distributions are not precisely known. They're educated guesses based on the results of a few experiments, a lot of manufacturer testing data, and anecdotal evidence from climbing accidents and incidents. What's important isn't the exact shape but an understanding of what factors contribute to the challenge and strength distributions and how these distributions combine into dissatisfaction. So first, I'll provide a general overview of all the factors that contribute to the shapes of these curves. I'll start with the challenges distribution, which I'll divide according to four separate categories, sneeze, take, fall arrest, and freaky bleep. In general, these categories are characterized both by their sources and the magnitude of the forces applied. Sneeze challenges occur often and are so tiny they seem insignificant. They result in forces that are small, single-digit newtons to a few hundred newtons, roughly ounces to perhaps tens of pounds. The causes of sneeze challenges are wide-ranging. The low end, the breeze from your sneeze, will exert a tiny force on the belay system, kicking carabiner as you move by it, gently pulling on a nut to see how it's seated. The vast bulk of the work that carabiners do occurs at these low force levels. Take challenges occur when applying body weight to the blade chain, and thus the forces are on the order of body weight, roughly half a kilonewton to three kilonewtons. Take. Fall arrest challenges are well understood. The force is a relatively straightforward function of the climber mass, fall factor, rope modulus, and the blayer behavior. As mass, fall factor, and rope modulus increase, the load applied during fall arrest increases slightly. Within reason, the more dynamic the belay, and thus the greater proportion of the fall energy that can be transformed into heat and motion of the belayer, the lower the applied load. Expected arrest forces range from 3 kN to 8 kN. Forces in the 10 to 12 kN range have been implicated in climbing accidents. Most fall arrests produce forces below 6 kN and the vast majority of fall arrest jobs produce forces below 7 kilonewtons. What can I say about freaky bleep challenges? These are bizarre outliers. Sometimes an avalanche cuts loose and applies 100 tons of force. Sometimes great columns of ice separate from the rest of the flow, pulling the blade chain with it. But the common freaky bleep challenge is accomplished by not using a dynamic rope to arrest a fall. A typical example occurs when a climber is tethered to an anchor with a sling, climbs above the anchor, and falls. The result is high fall factor fall on a tether that can be 10 to 100 times stiffer than dynamic rope. Such falls can easily exert forces that are 3 to 10 times as high as those that occur when a dynamic rope is used. I'm about a third of the way along. Let me recap where I am and how I got here. My contention is that carabiner contentment results from an appropriate match between the challenges that carabiners are asked to meet and the ability of the carabiner to perform these tasks. So far, I've identified four categories of carabiner challenges that account for the vast majority of forces that might plausibly be applied to a blade chain. Sneeze, take, fall arrest, and freaky bleep. When combined, 
These categories sum to a total challenge distribution, which shows all the challenges carabiners undertake according to the maximum force that occurs when undertaking this challenge. The next step is to look at the strengths that carabiners bring to these challenges. As with the challenge distribution, the carabiner strength distribution can be looked at as the sum of several components. I'll divide the contributions into four categories, loading along the carabiner's spine, loading that is not along the carabiner's spine, loading that causes the carabiner to release the rope, and loading that causes the carabiner to sever the rope. To ease worried minds, consider rope severing strengths first. For the carabiner to sever a rope is a highly unusual event. But carabiners that present a sharp edge on a rope-bearing surface have been reported to have cut the rope during fall arrest or even lowering. The poster children for such events are lowering with the rope through the carabiner's gate notch or running the rope over a carabiner where it has been previously nicked during a fall arrest when connected to a bolt hanger stamped from steel plate. The likelihood of rope severing is so low that it does not significantly affect the overall carabiner strength distribution. Rope release strengths are exceedingly low but carabiners have ticklish noses. The force required to open the carabiner gate is literally thousands of times less than the force required to break a carabiner. The right tickle at the wrong time can incapacitate a carabiner. An example of such ticklishness is when a quick draw is rotated around a bolt or other fixed attachment point. Although rope release is rare, its importance is due to its occurrence at low forces. At the high end of the force scale are the strengths that can be sustained by a carabiner loaded along its spine. This is a straightforward consequence of carabiner ergonomics. Carabiners are built to do the heavy lifting along the spine. The strength of a carabiner loaded along the carabiner's spine is well known, in part because the UIAA carabiner standards defines this strength. The width of this distribution is narrow because the materials from which carabiners are made are designed for such consistency. The remaining contribution to the strength distribution is a hodgepodge of different ways that carabiners can be loaded, all of which are not along the spine. Examples of such loading include open gate loading, minor axis loading, out of plane loading, multi point loading, nose hook, and figure eight gate torque. The 7 kN strength required by the UIAA carabiner standard for the open gate and minor axis loading provide a ballpark strength for many of these loadings that are not along the spine. But carabiner failure for some of these loading situations can be as low as body weight, especially the nose hook and the figure eight gate torque. I'm two thirds of the way there. Let me recap. On one hand are the challenges carabiners are asked to accomplish. These are a combination of elements I'm calling sneeze, take, fall arrest, and freaky bleep. On the other hand are the strengths that carabiners can be expected to have on the job. Again, I've divided these strengths into several components according to certain expectations, specifically whether the carabiner cuts the rope, releases the rope, is loaded along its spine, or is loaded not along its spine. Once the challenge and strength distributions are known, the question becomes how to put these two together. In some simple and perhaps self-evident sense, carabiner failure occurs when the force applied to a carabiner exceeds the carabiner's strength. The thin red sliver indicates the prevalence of carabiner failure. The thinner the sliver is, the more the risk of failure is reduced. The details of how to extract the failure sliver from the challenge and strength distributions is a bit of statistical magic. But it's the statistical magic that every five-year-old who has played the card game war understands. You can look at the job and strength distributions as hands that you might be dealt in the game of war. The distribution shows how many cards there are for a given card value. Now shuffle the decks, put down pairs of cards, and see what happens. The hand with the overwhelming predominance of high cards is really, really, really likely to win, but it doesn't win all the time. Every once in a long while, a difficult challenge for a carabiner is matched with a low strength, and the carabiner loses. So back to the original question posed at the start of this video. How does knowledge of the challenge and strength distributions help carabiners succeed at their job?